Okay, we're, we would like to welcome everybody again who is, uh, has come out to our worship service. And we would like to let you know that you're welcome to attend with us. We're near the uh, old Highway 11 and State Line Road, so come down and see us. So, we are so happy to uh, have a children's story today, and I guess that's me. <laughs> this, uh, this story that I'd like to tell happened to uh, me a long time ago, and I was called to be a missionary in Central America by the uh, Inter-American Division. They called me and wanted me to go down to a place called Guadalajara. And there were a lot of medical students down there going to uh, school and I wanted to go down and help them and they wanted me to be the pastor there. And we also had up in the mountains lots of Indian villages that we served with the airplane. And so I was a pastor, pilot, mechanic. And um, the story has to do with that. Now let me give some background. There were some brothers who had come up from Nicaragua and had opened up a church and built a church up there. And um, then there was another guy who had come from South America that I had met previously. And he came up and stayed with us in our home. His name was Edwin, Edwin Gomez. And the other, one of these brothers up in the mountains, his name is Orlando. Uh, Orlando Mongalo, if you can pronounce that. And Orlando and his brother did surgeries. His brother was the main surgeon and he did anesthesiology. That means you give people shots in different places in their body to kill the pain while they're doing surgery. And so uh, one, one was finishing medical school and Orlando was the doctor. Well, we decided to open up work in a new town. So the plan was to go in, the doctors go in and do medical work and teach the people how to handle emergencies because there was no doctor there and they had to know what to do and there was a snake bite on their children or something. So they went in and started holding these meetings. Well, it wasn't too long. This, this town we chose was named Villa Guerrero way up in the mountains and out in Mexico. And it wasn't long before in the large church there, they discovered that we were of a different faith, a different church than they were. Well, the leader of that church didn't like that. So what he did was he kind of stirred up the people. In fact, one day, these two men were walking along the road and he took his pickup truck and ran right at them and they had to dive into the ditch. And they, the people would come out of their meetings and they'd grab papers and they would burn their, their papers that they handed out, you know, medical papers and so forth, and dance around and yell hallelujahs. They thought they were some kind of Pentecostal, I guess. And they would bow down and they get that night they would come and throw rocks at their house. And some of the people outside threatened to kill them if they came out. So it got pretty serious. Well, one day a woman came and she had a big tumor on the side of her face. Now they, didn't, they felt it wasn't cancerous, but it really made her look bad. And her husband tried to find a doctor that could take out that tumor you know, they, they went to the big city, to specialists, and they said, we can't do it. Because if you take that tumor out, there's a nerve that goes right down through there called the facial nerve. And if we cut that, then her face will be all twisted up for the rest of her life. Well, she came to Orlando one day, and Orlando and, and Edwin, and she says, can you do anything? And... Of course, they said, with God, anything is possible. He can do anything. Wow. So she did. She came, and they did a surgery. And during the surgery, 
Orlando said to Edwin, I just cut the facial nerve. So they took out a big section of that facial nerve with the tumor. And uh, her face, of course, was kind of twisted. And they gave her some pain pills to go take at home. So uh, she took these pain pills home. And, and about 2 o'clock that night, of course, Edwin and, and Orlando were really worried because the people might, you know, tear them apart now. And about that, that night, about 2 o'clock, Orlando had a dream, and he dreamed that this, this woman, he saw this woman's face, and a hand came and just straightened out her face. And, uh, wow, he woke up and said, too bad my dreams don't come true. In the morning, here she comes to the door, knocking on the door, veiled, and uh, Orlando, who did the surgery, he ran upstairs. He says, you answer the door. <laughs> well, uh, Edwin went to the door, and she lifted up the veil, and her face was okay. And, and uh, he says, Orlando, come down here. Come down and look at this. So he ran down the stairs, and she told the story that at that night she got up to take the pain pill, and her mouth was clear over by her ear, and she was trying to get the pain pill in. And she says, it felt like a hand just came and straightened out my face. And... Uh, Orlando said, what time was that? She said, it was about 2 o'clock in the morning. Wow, the same time he had his dream. And, you know, it stayed that way. It stayed perfect. In fact, I, went, I would fly in and see them and take supplies and talk to them. And, cause, of course, Edwin lived in our house, so we knew him quite well. And I'd fly, I'd fly in and ask him, how's the lady? And they said, you know, it looks like she's not even going to have a scar. And uh, so, you know what happened? That her husband was so happy when they didn't have a place to live. She says, you come to our house. Her husband says, oh, by all means, you can stay as long as you want. And they continued their work in that town, and there were people baptized there. So do you think the Lord had something to do with that? Do you think we should have faith in what he has promised? So remember, trust him, and God can work some miraculous things in your life. Okay, you can go back now. do not be afraid. Oh, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God.
for prayer. Lord, as we listen to that music, Lord, it calls us to be still. Be still and know that I am God. And as we are gathered here in this quiet sanctuary, we humble ourselves before you. Lord, you are the God of all creation. You are the God who is a creator, sustainer, and the Savior. You are the one who has loved us and chosen us and called us. And Lord, you are calling us into your presence today and right now, and I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Amen. Amen. So this week I was uh, spending a lot of time in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. And it struck me that I really needed to learn something about gravity. So I started to do a little bit of research on gravity. Did you know that gravity is one of the weakest forces that we know of? Now you look at me like, are, are you kidding me? Because we're all being held down to this earth by this force that we can't get away from. Yeah, that's right. Gravity is one of the weakest forces that we know of. Just take an example right here. I got a ball, a little foam ball. I can throw it up. I can break gravity. The reality is that gravity, everything has gravity. You have gravity. In fact, everything that has mass has, to a degree, has gravity. So, you know, we, we have gravity because, uh, and that gravity draws. Now, it's infinitesimally small. So we wouldn't feel that gravity unless, you know, two people were in love and then they feel the gravity, right? But uh, when we talk about gravity, we are talking specifically about Earth's gravity. And because Earth is such a massive, it has such a massive mass, that, that creates the gravity, and so, you know, it's, gra by the way, gravity and weight aren't the same thing. Gravity is what causes objects that are drawn, dropped, to fall towards the center of the earth. But what happens is that the earth, of course, pushes back, and that's what causes weight. Now, if I were to go to the moon, I would not weigh 100, 205 pounds. My, my weight would be different up on the moon moon. So the question is, we know that, that gravity is a force, and I'm glad for gravity, you know, I'm glad that, uh, you know, I'm not floating around, you know, that there are good things about the gravitational pull. But 
What does it take to break that gravitational pull? There's a term that I uh, came to learn this week called escape velocity. It is the speed at which we can break this gravitational pull and put something into space. And that escape velocity is approximately 11.2 kilometers per second. Now, just to put it in perspective, that's close to 33 times the speed of sound. Now, NASA is trying to figure out how to sling satellites into outer space. It's a lot cheaper than putting them on rockets. And so they have this accelerator, and it's a massive it's an accelerator, and they'll accelerate it with zero, uh, it's in a vacuum. So they pump out all the air, it's totally vacuum, and then they'll spin it around really fast, kind of like a centrifuge, and then they shoot it up. Now, I'm not sure exactly all the physics behind it, but supposedly this is supposed to save them a lot of money. But friends, today we are going to talk about a different type of Earth's gravity. I want to just do just a quick review because some people watching online may not realize that this is actually the third of a series of messages. The first message was uh, probably about a month ago, and it was called um, um, Mercy. That's right. It had to do with mercy, the mercy of God. And um, the mercy of God it basically comes in five words. The foundation of Christianity has to do with God's character. Second message was the oxymoron. And we looked at that a couple weeks ago. We are to live our lives as a living sacrifice, to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. But today we're going to talk about the gravitational pull. And that's found in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. So I invite you to open your Bibles to Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So when we talk about the gravitational pull, I felt it, you felt it, we all know what it's like to be drawn by the Earth's gravitational pull. And I'm not talking about the, what, what we just talked about, gravity. We're talking about the carnal nature that is drawing us to sin and disobedience. So today we're going to do a deep dive. Today I want to go deeply into this subject and I want to look at this word conformed. The Bible says, Paul says in Romans 12, verse 2, Be ye not conformed to this world. The word conformed is a Greek word, sous schematizo. And that word is found in the middle and the passive voice. Well, you say, what is a middle or a passive voice? Well, Verbs in the Greek language have three voices. There's the active, there's the middle, and the passive. The active voice is something that you do, something that is an action that takes place. It's the simple action that, uh, that happens. The middle voice is something that you do to yourself. And the, the passive voice is something that happens to you. Someone else does something for you. So active, middle, and passive. In this specific verb, suskematizo, it's actually a compound verb of two things. And this is going to help crack the code to understand what is gravity, the gravity of this world that holds us and draws us. The first word is soon. Soon is a preposition, a primary preposition that denotes union with something. Soon, united with, together with something. The word schema is, um, is the second word, and it is something that um, is everything in a person which strikes the senses, the figure, the bearing, 
the discourse, actions, a manner of life. We get the English words schematic. Those of you who have taken electrical engineering understand that a schematic diagram diagrams an entire electrical circuit, all the parts of it. So when you put these two words together is you are putting together the schema or the, the entire being of something and you're uniting it to something else together with the, the, the being of something. So when you put those two together, then you get conformity. So the world has a certain, I call it a culture, okay? The word schema, I think of it as culture. The world has a culture. And when we spend a lot of time in that culture, you are going to be transformed. Now, suske matizo comes in the middle or the passive. So it can be rightly translated either way. So it would sound like this. Don't conform yourself to the world. You can say that. And also, don't allow the world to conform you to itself. Amen. As one Bible translation puts it, don't let the world push you or force you into its mold. Yes, yes. So, 1 Corinthians 15, 33 Paul says it very clearly. Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. That's what's going on here. I remember, I remember a number of years ago when I was in Parima, Parima Village, there was, um, I, I, I flew out there with, with my wife. When we first went to Parima, it was just my wife and I. We of course, had two daughters along the way. But I thought, you know, when you go out to this village, it's going to be this idyllic place far away from the city, far away from any sort of sin or influence. In fact, it was an Adventist village. What more could you ask for? An Adventist village. And so imagine my surprise when we stepped out of the little missionary airplane and we're walking down the path and along come these village boys and they're wearing baggy pants and they have one of their pant legs rolled up, you know, kind of like the gangsters, you know, in New York. And they got their cap, their gangster caps, and they got them turned kind of sideways like that. And I said to myself, what is this? What is going on here? How can you get this all the way out here? Well, I found out that what they had, they had the world in their pocket. They were watching videos. Now, granted, they didn't have cell phone signal, but they would share these videos and all sorts of different things around the village, and then they got the, all these bright ideas of how to wear their pants and roll up this and, and the other. And, and so here, far away from the city of Georgetown, they were acting like the city. You know, Ellen White says that we should be living the ci leaving the cities, and I believe that. There will come a time in which there will be persecution, and we can't be in those cities anymore. But friends, when you leave the city, make sure to leave the city out of your pocket too. You know what I'm talking about? I had a boy's dean. I commented to this uh, to one of my boy's deans, and he chuckled. He says, "Yeah, I used to. I used to be like that. I used to uh, wear baggy pants and roll up my pant leg and so on." He says, "Do you realize, James, where that came from?" He says that came from the inner cities where people were so poor they couldn't afford their own pants, so they wore a pair of their father's pants, which was baggy. And they had to roll up their pant leg because when they would be riding their bicycle to school, they didn't want it getting caught in the chain. He says, you want to know something really funny? He says, these kids have rolled up the wrong pant leg. And so he was laughing. He thought it was just the funniest thing. And uh, 
I thought that was pretty good too. But the reality is that, when, that to, we must not only leave the city, we must leave the city emotionally, spiritually. Do you see, this, this world has a culture. It's going to suck you in if you spend time in a, lo a long, protracted time in its presence. Now, think about this. The opposite is true, too. If we draw near to God, we will be transformed into His image. So there's this, there's this, there's this, this struggle back and forth. We are being drawn in two directions, either towards the world or towards Christ. Question is that I ask myself and I ask you too, what direction are you being pulled? As we continue to study Romans chapter 12, verse 2, I want to look up a passage of Scripture. Keep your finger there in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Let's go to 1 Peter 4, verse, uh, correction, 1 Peter 1, verse 14. Because this word, Suskematizo, which is a middle or a passive, shows up in 1 Peter 1, verse 14. The Bible says, As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. Now, I underlined that, and I put the Greek word there. That word... Greek word 4964, which is suske matizo, not fashioning yourself according to the former lusts in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. So God calls us to obedience. What does obedience look, for, look like? Well, obedience is not conforming ourselves, but being holy. So you say, how do I become holy? Now here's where it gets exciting, because we're going to put in parallel these two passages of Scripture, and it will become clear. Did you realize that Romans chapter 12, verse 2, and 1 Peter 1, verse 14 are parallel passages? Look at it there. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Do not be conformed. That's a middle or a passive. But be transformed. Oh, that's a passive. That word is something that we don't do. It is something that happens to us. Are you following me? It says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, look at 1 Peter 1, verse 14. Do not... Fashion yourself, that's a middle or a passive as well. But be holy. What is that? That's a passive. So transformation and holiness is not something that we do. Let me make that crystal clear. If you've come this morning thinking that you need to transform yourself, forget it. The gravitational pull of this world is too strong for you. You can't do it. If you think that being holy is something that you are, you have to set yourself about to do, kind of like a New Year's resolution, how well do your New Year's resolutions, are anyone still doing their New Year's resolutions? Maybe I shouldn't ask. Or maybe you should ask me. The reality is, is that transformation and holiness is something that God does. It is an entire work of God. Praise the Lord. Now let me ask a really challenging question because maybe some of you have already considered it. You know, the Great Commission, Jesus gave the Great Commission, go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, of all basically of the world, right? We are to make disciples of the world. How do you make disciples of the world and not get sucked in? Have you ever thought about that? 
That is a challenging question because some people, well-meaning people, have gone into situations and gotten sucked up in that worldly atmosphere. Let me suggest there are two individuals that we need to look at. Let's look at Enoch. Let's go to uh, the book Patriarchs and Prophets, page 85 and 86. This is speaking about Enoch. I'm going to read here. Listen carefully. Distressed by the increasing wickedness of the ungodly and fearing that their infidelity might lessen his reverence for God. Are you following? That's the gravity. Enoch avoided constant association with them and spent much time in solitude, giving himself to meditation and prayer. In the midst of a life of active labor, Enoch steadfastly maintained his communion with God. So there's this mountain in the multitude, right? He spent time in the mountain with God, goes down to the multitude and spends time ministering for the souls of men. The greater and more pressing his labors, the more constant and earnest were his prayers. He continued to exclude himself at certain periods from all society. After remaining for a time among people, laboring to benefit them by instruction and example, he would withdraw and spend a season in solitude, hungering and thirsting for that divine knowledge which God alone can impart. Communing thus with God, Enoch came more and more to reflect the what? The divine image. Is that your desire? Is there anyone that came this morning that wants to reflect the divine image? Sign me up. Enoch began to reflect the divine image. How much did he have to work on that? Did he have to really struggle? i got to change myself into the... Did that work? No. He spent time in the presence of God and... God changed him into the image of the divine. Watch this. His face was radiant with holy light, even the light that shineth in the face of Jesus. As he came forth from these divine communings, even the ungodly beheld with awe the impress of heaven upon his countenance. Whoo! Wow! That's what I want. Now notice what it says in the book Steps to Christ about Jesus. God does not mean that any of us should become hermits or monks and retire from the world in order to devote ourselves to acts of worship. Has anyone heard of Simeon the Stylite? Maybe it's been a while since you've heard of Simeon the Stylite. Sat on the top of a pole for 37 years, trying to get close to God, trying to avoid the world. Is that what God is wanting? No, that's not what God wants. The life must be like Christ's life. What was that? Between the mountain and the multitude. He who does nothing but pray will soon cease to pray or his prayers will become a formal routine. So this is the balance. God is calling us. God is calling us to to the mountain to speak with us commune with us and in that experience we will be transformed and as we go out from that experience we will be lights in our community transformed by the way that word transformed let's look at that fascinating word it's the word metamorpho to change transfigure or transform it's the word english word we get metamorphosis from Did you know that the word metamorphosis, we think of it as a caterpillar, spins a chrysalis, and over a period of time, you can't see what's going on, but scientists tell us that every single part changes in that caterpillar, every one. There is no retained parts. Powerful chemicals start to come into play and start to break down every part of the caterpillar, and then it rebuilds it again, into a beautiful butterfly. That is the word. When it talks about we must be transformed, there is nothing retained of the old person. 
it is all new. Now, there are four times that this word shows up. Four times. And all of them are in the passive. We don't transform ourselves, as we already talked about. But let's look at it. First two times happen, and they are parallel passages, Matthew 17, verse 2, and Mark 9, verse 2. Jesus went up on a mountain and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was as white as the light. Who transformed Jesus? Did he transform himself? Or did his father? As his father drew near to him, he began to be transformed into his divine figure. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. There it is again. Transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, what's fascinating about this is this is an, in an imperative. So it says, be transformed. This is emphatic. You must be transformed. And I'll say it to you, and I'll say it straight. Every one of us needs to be transformed by the Spirit of God. God is calling us not to be like the world, to be, be, to be conformed to the world, but to be transformed. Yes, yes. Transformed. And you say, how do you do that? How do you do that? Well, let me give you the, the solution. This is in 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18. Here come the keys. Watch carefully. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are being, same word, same word, transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. All four times this word shows up, it's always in the passive. Nobody transforms themselves. Never. Transformation is, comes from the power of God. So you ask the question, Pastor, are you talking about a do-nothing religion? A religion where you just kind of sit down and, okay, I'm waiting, do it. No. There is something that we must do. There is something that only God can do, and there is something that we must do. What is the thing that we must do? We must be renewed in our mind. It says we must be transformed by the renewing of the mind. Now, let's, before we get to the renewing, let's look at that second passage of Scripture, Romans 12, verse 2. Let's compare it with 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18. But we all with unveiled face, now this is a reference to Moses' experience as he went up on the mountain to talk with God. Now watch what, what Paul does here. He's going to give us the clues. How do we be transformed? How, how are we going to be transformed? Watch this. We all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So the first word, the first clue is behold. You got to look at something. You know, the, the reality is God is calling you to focus on certain things. God is calling you to focus your attention in certain directions. It says, by beholding, we are to behold or look at or contemplate what? The glory of the Lord. What is the glory? The glory involves the character of God. Remember when God came down and he revealed, took his hand away, he revealed his glory? What did he say? Moses saw something. But God also spoke what he was seeing. The problem is we, did, we, we don't know exactly what he saw, but we do know what he heard because he wrote it down. So God was revealing his glory as he was proclaiming his character. God's glory involves his character. So as we behold the glory, we are transformed. Did it happen for Moses? Was Moses transformed? Did he have to work really hard at being transformed? No. His purpose was to look at the glory, the glory of the Lord. Can we behold the glory of the Lord? 
Yes. In what way? By looking into the mirror. When I was in college, I had a short-lived fascination with astronomy. I really wanted to uh, learn more about outer space and the planets and so on. I say it was short-lived because I, I realized to my chagrin that in order to be a good astrono astronomer, you'd have to stay up at night. And I liked my sleep. <laughs> but I wanted to build a telescope. And so I was looking around to try to find uh, a place where I could find a parabolic mirror. But I was fascinated because in the, uh, in, in the description of these mirrors, it said it had a dire warning, do not allow the light to shine on this mirror. Like the sunlight, direct sunlight. Do not allow direct sunlight to shine on this mirror. You know why? Because it starts fires wherever it focuses. And you can very quickly burn your house down if you're not careful. Isn't that the case with the word of God. Why do you think the devil was trying to get rid of the parabolic mirror in his time? Because it was capable of starting fires. And Satan was trying to put out the fire of, of the gospel. And so that's why he was getting rid of the mirror, the gospel of Jesus, the word of God. See, the mind is renewed when, and transformed when we look into the mirror at the image of God. And you know what? We become changed into what image? The same image that we see, right? Who does the work? Right from the text, it says, just as by the what? Spirit of the Lord. It is God that does the transformation. Our job is to look. God's job is to transform. It can't be clearer than that. Two doctors from the National Institute of Mental Health did a study on finger tapping. I don't know where they come up with this, but they did a study on finger tapping. And uh, they, what they did was they got people to come into their laboratory and they hooked them up to the MRI and they said, okay, tap your finger. Tap, 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 tap. And they looked on the MRI to see which part of the brain was being activated. And once they figured out which brain, part of the brain, they said, okay, for the next four weeks, we want you to go and uh, daily, daily to tap your finger. And so day after day, tap, 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 tap. After four weeks, just four weeks, they took them back into the laboratory. They put them in the MRI and they studied that part of the brain that was the finger tapping part. And would you know, they had built new neurons and pathways, and that part of their brain was built up. Now think about this. You know, the spirit of prophecy tells us that when we study the word of God, it broadens the mind and ennobles the character. Isn't that right? Because it involves the frontal lobe of the mind. It develops the frontal lobe of our brains. We are recruiting new nerve cells, rewiring neural pathways in our frontal lobe. That's called the renewing of the mind. By the renewing of our minds, we are not to be conformed, but we are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. The Greek word anakinosis, the renewal, renovation, or complete change for the better. Now, this shows up, that word renewing shows up only one other time. That word shows up only one other time found in Titus 3, verse 5. Not by the works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy. mercy. Have we talked about mercy, transformed by mercy? According to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration. I put baptism down there, and I'll explain why in a second. And the renewing, same word, anakinosis, the renewing of the... Holy Ghost. So what is it that changes the mind? It's the Holy Spirit's presence. Jesus says the two parts. He says, unless you are born of the water and of the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. You cannot see that. That is the key. Those two parts must be there, and it's the Holy Spirit which brings about 
the, revival, the renewal of our mind. The frontal lobe is literally the living room of the Holy Spirit. I want you to think about this. What is it that you are putting in God's living room? Some people sit down in front of television, and anything that comes across the television is like a big sewer pipe right into the living room. Would you put up with that? You know, God's very long-suffering. God is very long-suffering. But many times we bring things into the living room of our mind. And the Holy Spirit, it just, it's revolting. That's why it says in Ephesians 4, verse 22, that you put off, there are things to put off, right? Put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed, how? In the spirit of your mind. Paul says, when you are united together with Christ, there are certain things that need to be left behind in that baptismal pool. That is your old life. You go into that, that pool as an old man, and you come up, as a new person in Christ Jesus. And so this is the essence of what does it mean to be a follower of Christ. We leave those old things behind and we put on the new things which the Spirit gives us. Now I'm going to share with you 10, 10 verses of Scripture. I generally don't, don't share long passages of Scripture. But this says it all. It kind of sums it all up together in one. Colossians 3, verse 1 through 10. If then you were raised with Christ, we're talking about baptism, how we are united together with Christ. We've talked about this in the last couple messages. When you were baptized, what you were saying is, my life is now united together with Jesus in his death, burial, and resurrection. When Jesus died and he was laid in the grave and on the third day was resurrected back to life, so I am with Christ. I go down into the water, symbolizing death. I am, a, I am dead to my sins and my transgressions in the grave, as it were, under the water, and I come up to a new life in Christ Jesus. My life is united together with him. But it doesn't stop there. This is so powerful because when Jesus was resurrected to heaven, we went with him and we are seated with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Praise the Lord. Yesterday I had a lady come in to my office. She's being harassed by the demonic influence. And I said, I, I want to share a passage of scripture in Ephesians chapter 1 and 2. I said, Satan has no authority with Christ. Satan has zero authority because if our life is united together with Jesus and we are dead, buried, resurrected, and raised up and seated with him in heavenly places, it says in Ephesians chapter 2 that God had put all principalities and powers under his feet. That's Christ's feet, not my feet, but because I am together with Christ. And, and, and abiding in him, Satan has no authority over me. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Somebody's awake. Yeah. <laughs> Satan has no authority over God's people. Amen. So we need to, we are with Christ seated at his right hand, at the right hand of God. Verse 2, set your mind on things above, not on things of this world, this earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Amen. Therefore, put to death your members. This is the old way of life, right? which are on the earth, fornication. He lists this, fornication, uncleanness, passion, 
evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. Let me pause right there. Many people think that God is angry with sinners. God is not angry with sinners. God has come to save sinners. And that includes everyone here. But God hates sin. And if only we can get a, just the tip, of a, uh, the, the tip of the iceberg of our understanding of how much God hates sin. He hates it with an eternal hatred. And so he's coming to destroy it. So, we are to put to, get, put to death fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience in which you yourselves once walked. Watch that. You're not walking in that way anymore, right? You once walked. It's a past tense. It's no longer because you are now with Christ. You once walked when you lived in them. But now you yourselves are to put off these things. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man which is renewed in what? What what does your Bible say? In knowledge according to the image of him who created him. So the renewal of happens when we set our minds on things above, not on the things of this earth. The old man, these old habits, they got to go. Romans 6, verse 11, Consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ. So the new man is to be renewed by knowledge. Where do we get that knowledge? From the mirror from the mirror, right? And as we come to know Christ, our mind is renewed and we are transformed into the image of Christ. Let me share a quote from Messages to Young People. This is what is so clear. Few realize that it is a duty to exercise control over the thoughts and imaginations. It is difficult to keep the undisciplined mind fixed upon profitable subjects. But if the thoughts are not properly employed, religion cannot flourish in the soul. The mind must be preoccupied with sacred and eternal things or it will cherish trifling and superficial thoughts. So either we are focusing on the things above and if we refuse to focus on God's the heavenly topics that are of utmost importance, if we don't do it, gravity takes over. It's that simple. You have to keep fighting. Keep fighting the good fight and focus your attention on that which is above, not on the things of this earth. This morning I'm going to be a little bit vulnerable because this morning I'm going to share something about my own life. You know, I've, I've struggled with, with uh, competitive sports over the years. And when I was a boy, I liked to watch American football. And the reason why I'm sharing this um, illustration is because the big game is tomorrow. Those of you who laughed know what I'm talking about. The Super Bowl is, um, is the climax. It's the biggest, most watched game Uh, other than the World Cup in the world. Every 30 seconds, 30 second advertisement is worth $7 million. I don't have to tell you about the ungodly advertisements or the halftime show. You already know what I'm talking about. But then it goes much further, it goes much deeper because this is such a violent sport. My father calls it gladiator sports. It's true, because they hit each other with such powerful force it is causing brain damage, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. But there's a darker side even still. The Super Bowl is the largest human trafficking event in the world. 
That's the part that they don't advertise. And you know what drives it? Eyeballs. Eyeballs. If nobody watched the Super Bowl, nobody would pay $7 million to broadcast an advertisement that nobody watched. So I'm, I'm sharing this because I feel the pull. Maybe you do too. I feel the pull. So what do you do? What do you do? What do I do? Let's go over several points. Number one, preach a sermon on it. <laughs> Admit that you have a problem. Number two, focus. When the mind drifts, pull it back. When you're walking down the super mile, supermarket aisle and you see the advertisements for the Super Bowl, look away. When you're walking, when, when you see a scantily clad woman, gentlemen, look away. Redirect your focus. Stay away from the environments that are tempting. Overcome evil with good. Do something during that time. Don't just, just do nothing and just wonder, okay, I wonder what the score is. You know, overcome evil with good. Spend time in the Word looking at the cross, looking at Jesus. Pray. Pray that the Holy Spirit will fill your life. Remember, it's the Holy Spirit that changes us into the image of Christ. And then 2 Peter 1 verse 4, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these we might become partakers of the divine nature having what? Escape the what? The corruption, that's gravity. The corruption that is in the world through lust. Let us pray. Father in heaven, strengthen us, empower us, help us to live the life of true followers of Jesus Christ. Give us the Holy Spirit to, to, help us to help us to break every single habit that is not according to your word. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Next week, we are going to continue with a story that covers everything that we've covered today. God bless. Hello, my name is James Ash, and I want to thank you for watching Stateline Advent Media. If you like what you saw today, make sure and check out our content on YouTube, Rumble, Facebook, or Gab. All you have to do is type in Stateline Advent Media, and it should pop right up to the surface. Remember to like and subscribe. And if you'd like to find out more information how you can partner together with us in our ministry, go to www.statelineadventmedia.org. Thank you and God bless.